いらっしゃいませ。Welcome to my reading of Genji Monogatari or A Tale of Genji. I'm gonna hopefully be entertaining you with readings from the chapters of Genji Monogatari and maybe some of the other pieces of classical Japanese or other Asian pieces of literature, or I should say pieces of Asian literature. That didn't come out right. Anyways. Here we go, chapter one, the Paulonia Pavilion. I'll be reading from the English translation of this great epic novel. In a certain reign, whose can it have been? Someone of no very great rank among all his majesty's consorts and intimates enjoyed exceptional favor. Those others who had always assumed that pride of place was properly theirs despised her as a dreadful woman. While the lesser intimates were unhappier still, the way she waited on him day after day only stirred up feeling against her, and perhaps this growing burden of resentment was what affected her health and obliged her often to withdraw in misery to her home but his majesty who could less and less do without her ignored his critics until his behavior seemed bound to be the talk of all from this sad spectacle the senior nobles and privy gentlemen could only avert their eyes such things had led to disorder and ruin even in china they said and as discontent spread throughout the throughout through the realm, whoops, the example of Yoki He came more and more to mind, with many a painful consequence for the lady herself. Yet she trusted in his gracious and unexampled affection and remained at court. The grand counselor, her father, was gone, and it was her mother, a lady from an old family, who saw to it that she should give no less to court events. Than others whose parents were both alive and who enjoyed general esteem. But lacking anyone influential to support her, she often had reason when the time came to lament the weakness of her position. His Majesty must have had a deep bond with her in past lives as well, for she gave him a wonderfully handsome son. He had the child brought in straight away, for he was desperate to see him. And he was astonished by his beauty. His elder son, born to his consort, the daughter of the minister of the right, enjoyed powerful backing and was fated by all as the undoubted future heir apparent. But he could not rival his brother in looks, and his majesty, who still accorded him all due respect, therefore lavished his private affection on the new arrival. Her rank had never permitted her to. Sorry for the brief pause. Her rank had never permitted her to enter His Majesty's common service. His insistence on keeping her with him, despite her fine reputation and her noble bearing, meant that whenever there was to be music or any other sort of occasion, his first thought was to send for her. Sometimes, after oversleeping a little, he would command her to stay with him, and this refusal to let her go made her seem to deserve contempt. But after the birth, he was so attentive that the mother of his firstborn feared that he might appoint his new son heir apparent over her own. The consort, for whom he had high regard, had been the first to come to him, and it was she whose reproaches most troubled him, and whom he could least bear to hurt for she had given him other children as well. Despite her faith in his majesty's sovereign protection, so many belittled her and sought to find fault with her, that far from flourishing, she began in her distress to waste away. She lived in the Kiritsubo. His majesty had to pass many others on his constant visits to her. And no wonder they took offense. On the far too frequent occasions, 
when she went to him. There might be a nasty surprise awaiting her along the cross bridges and bridgeways, one that horribly fouled the skirts of the gentlewoman who accompanied her, or who came forward to receive her, or the victim of a conspiracy between those on either side. She might find herself locked in a passageway between two doors that she could not avoid, and be unable to go either forward or back. Seeing how she suffered from such humiliations, endlessly made, endlessly multiplied as circumstances favored her enemy's designs, His Majesty had the intimate long residence in the Koroden moved elsewhere, and gave it to her instead for when he wanted to have her nearby. The one evicted nursed a particularly implacable grudge. In the child's third year, his father gave him a downing of the trousers, just as impressive as his firstborn's, marshalling for the purpose all the treasures in the court repository in the imperial stores. This only provoked more complaints, but as the boy grew, he revealed such marvels of beauty and character that no one could resent him. The discerning could hardly believe their eyes, and they wondered that such a child should have ever been born. In the summer of that year, His Majesty's haven became unwell, but he refused her leave to withdraw. He felt no alarm since her health had long been fragile, and he only urged her to be patient a little longer. However, she worsened daily, until just five or six days later she was so weak that her mother's tearful entreaties at last and persuaded him to release her. In fear of suffering some cruel humiliation even now, she left the child behind and stole away. His majesty, who could no longer keep her by him, suffered acutely to think that he could not even see her off. There she lay, lovely and ever so dear, but terribly thin now, and unable to tell him of her deep trouble and sorrow because she lingered in a state of semi-consciousness, a sight that drove from his mind all notion of time past, or to come and reduced him simply to assuring her tearfully in every way he knew how much he loved her. When she failed to respond but only lay limp and apparently fainting, with the, faint, with the light dying from her eyes, he had no idea what to do. Even after issuing a decree to allow her the privilege of a hand carriage, he went in to her again, and could not bring himself to let her go. You promised never to leave me, not even at the end, he said. You cannot abandon me now. I will not let you. She was so touched that she managed to breathe. Now the end has come, and I am filled with sorrow that our ways must part. The path I would rather take is the one that leads to life. If only I had known. She seemed to have more to say but to be too exhausted to go on, which only decided him, despite her condition, to see her through to whatever might follow. He consented only unwillingly to her departure, when, urgent, when urgently reminded that excellent healers were to start prayers for her that evening at her own home. With his heart too full for sleep, he anxiously awaited dawn. He expressed deep concern even before his messenger had time to come back from her house. Meanwhile, the messenger heard lamenting and learnt that just past midnight she had breathed her last, and he therefore returned in sorrow. This news put his majesty in such a state that he shut himself away, wholly lost to all around him. He still longed to see his son, but the child was soon to withdraw, for no precedent authorized one in mourning to wait upon the emperor. The boy did not understand what the matter was, and he gazed in wonder at the sobbing gentlewoman who had served his mother and at Tanosama's streaming tears. Such partings are sad at the best of times, and his very innocence made this one moving beyond words. Now it was time to proceed with the customary funeral. Her mother longed with many tears to rise with her daughter's smoke into the sky, 
and she insisted on joining the gentlewomen in their carriage in the funeral cortege. What grief she must have known on reaching Otagi, where the most imposing rite was underway. With her body plain to see before me, she said, I feel that she is still alive, even though she is not, and I will therefore watch her turn to ash the to learn that she is really gone. She spoke composedly enough, but a moment later she was racked by such paroxysm of grief that she nearly fell from the carriage. Oh, I knew it, the gentlewoman cried to each other, not knowing how to console her. A messenger came from the palace, followed by an imperial envoy who read a proclamation granting the deceased the third rank. It was very sad. His majesty had never even named her a consort, but it pained him not to have done so, and he had wished at, la at least to raise her a step in dignity. Even this made many resent her further, but the wiser ones at last understood that her loveliness in looks and bearing, and her sweet gentleness of temper, had made her impossible actually to dislike. It was his majesty's unbecoming pension for her, so his gentlewoman now understood, that had made some treat her with cold disdain. And they remembered her fondly for the warmth and kindness of her disposition. It was a perfect example of, now she is gone. As the dreary days slipped by, his majesty saw carefully to each succeeding memorial service. The passage of time did so little to relieve his sorrow that he called none of his ladies to wait on him after dark, but instead passed day and night in weeping. And even those who merely witnessed his state found the autumn very dewy indeed. She meant so much to him that even dead she is a blight on one's existence, summed up the sentiments of the Kokiden consort, as merciless as ever on the subject. The mere sight of his elder son would only remind his majesty how much he preferred the younger, and he would then send a trusted gentlewoman or nurse to find out how he was getting on. At dusk, one blustery and suddenly chilly autumn day, Tenosama assailed more than ever by memories, dispatched the gentlewoman dubbed Yuge no Miobu to his love's home. Then, after she had left under a beautiful evening moon, he lapsed again into reverie. He felt her there beside him, just as she had always been on evenings like this when he had called for music, and when her touch on her instrument, or at least word to him, had been so much her own, except that he would have preferred even to this vivid dream or simple reality in the dark. Miobu had no sooner arrived and gone in through the gate than desolation touched her. The mother had kept the place up, despite being a widow, and she had lived nicely enough out of fond concern for her only daughter. But alas, now that grief had laid her low, the weeds grew tall and looked cruelly blown about by the winds, until only moonlight slipped smoothly through their tangles. She had Miobu alight on the south side of the house. At first she could not speak. I keep wishing that I had not lived so long, she said at last, and I am so ashamed now to see someone from his majesty struggle all the way to me through these weeds. She wept as though it were truly more than she could bear. The dame of staff told his majesty how desperately sorry for you she felt after her visit here, and how broke, heartbroken she was, Miobu replied. And even I, who pretend to no delicacy of feeling, understand what she meant all too well. Then after composing herself a little, she delivered his majesty's message. For a time I was sure that I must be dreaming. But now that the turmoil in my mind has subsided, what I still find acutely painful is to have no one with whom to talk over what needs to be done. Would you be kind enough to visit me privately? I am anxious about my son and disturbed that he should be surrounded every day by such grieving. Please come soon. He kept breaking into tears and never really managed to finish. But he knew all too well as I could see that to another, 
he might not be looking very brave. And I felt so much for him that I hurried off to you before I had actually heard all he had to say. Then Miobu gave her Tenosama's letter. Though tears darkened my eyes, the lady said, by the light of his most wise and gracious words, and she began to read. I had thought that time might bring consolations to begin lightening my sorrow, but as the passing days and months continued to disappoint me, I hardly know how to bear my grief. Again and again my thoughts go to the little boy, and it troubles me greatly that I cannot look after him with you. Do come and see me in memory of days now gone. He had written with deep feeling and had added the poem, Hearing the wind sigh, burdening with drops of dew, all Miyagi moor, my heart helplessly goes out to the little huggy frond. But she could not read it to the end. Now that I know how painful it is to live long, she said, I am ashamed to imagine what that pine must think of me. And for that reason especially, I would not dare to frequent his majesty's seat. It is very good indeed of him to favor me with these repeated invitations, but I am afraid that I could not possibly bring myself to go. His son, on the other hand, seems eager to do so, although I am not sure just how much he understands. And while it saddens me that he should feel that way, I cannot blame him. Please let Tenodono know these my most in my inmost thoughts. I fear that the child's dignity will suffer if he remains here, for I am a creature of misfortune, and it would be wrong for him to stay. The little boy was asleep. I had wanted to see him so that I could report on him to his majesty, Miobu said as she prepared to hasten away. But I am expected back. It must be very late by now. I would so like to talk to you longer, to lift a little of the unbearable darkness from my heart. She replied, please come to see me on your own too, whenever you wish. You always used to visit at happy festive times, and seeing you now on so sad an errand reminds me, reminds one how very painful life is. We had such hopes for her from the time she was born, and my husband, the late Grand Counselor, kept urging me, almost until his last breath, to achieve his ambition for her and have her serve his majesty. Do not lose heart and give up, he said, just because I am gone. So I did send her, although I felt that if she had to enter palace service without anyone to support her properly, it might be wiser to refrain because what mattered to me was to honor his last oh to what mattered to me sorry i kind of messed up there i lost my place to me was to honor his last wishes unfortunately his majesty became more far more fond than was right of someone who did not deserve that degree of favor but she seems to have borne the disgraceful treatment she received and to have continued serving him until the growing burden of others' jealousy and the increasing unpleasantness to which she was subjected led her to break down as she did, and that is why I wish that his majesty had not cared for her so much. I suppose I only say that, though, because her losses plunged me into such terrible shadows. Her voice trailed off, and she wept. By now it was very late. His majesty feels as you do, Miobu assured her. I now understand. He says, how damaging my love for her really was, because the way I insisted, despite my better judgment on favoring her to the point of scandal, meant that it could not have gone on very long. I had no wish to offend anyone, and yet because of her, I provoked resentment on those whom I should not have hurt, only to lose her in the end, and to linger on inconsolable. A sorrier spectacle now than I have ever made of myself before. I wish I knew what in my past lives could have brought all this upon me. This is what he says again and again. And as he does so, he is never very far from weeping. Miobu talked on and at last said tearfully, It is now very late, and I must not let the night go by without bringing his majesty your answer. 
she hastily prepared to return to the palace. The moon was setting in a beautifully clear sky. The wind had turned distinctly cold, and the crickets crying from among the grasses seemed to be calling to her to weep with them, until she could hardly bear to leave this house of humble misery. Bell crickets may cry until they can cry no more, but not so for, a, for me. For all through the endless night my tears will fall on and on, she said. She could not get into her carriage. Here where crickets cry more and more unhappily in finning grasses, you who live above the clouds bring still heavier fall of, of dew. I would soon have been blaming you, the answer came. This was no time for pretty parting gifts, and she gave me Obu instead, in her daughter's memory, some things that she had saved for her, saved for just such an occasion, a set of gowns and some accessories that her daughter had used to put up her hair. The young gentlewomen who had served her daughter were, of course, saddened by the loss of their mistress, but they missed the palace now they were used to it, and memories of his majesty moved them to urge that his son should be should move there as quickly as possible. But she felt sure that people would disapprove if one as ill-fated as herself were to accompany him. And since she also knew how much she worried whenever he was out of sight, she could not bring herself to let him go. Miobu felt a pang of sympathy when she found that his majesty had not yet retired for the night. The garden court was in its autumn glory, and on the pretext of admiring it, he had quietly called into attendance four or five of his most engaging gentlewomen, with whom he was now conversing. Lately, he had been spending all his time examining illustrations of the Song of Unending Sorrow, commissioned by Emperor Uda, with poems by Issei and Tsura, Tsurayuki, and other poems as well, in native speech or in Chinese, as long as they were on that theme which was the constant topic of his conversation. He questioned Miobu carefully about her visit, and she told him in private how sad it had been. Then he read the lady's reply. She had written, Your Majesty's words inspire such awe that I am unworthy to receive them. Confusion overwhelms me in the presence of sentiments so gracious. Ever since that tree whose buffs took the cruel wind, withered, and was lost. My heart is sorely troubled for the little hoggy frond, and so on, a rather distracted letter. Although His Majesty understood how upset she still was, and no doubt forgave her, he struggled in vain to control himself, despite his resolve to betray no strong emotion. A rush of memories even brought back the days when he had first known his love, and he was shocked to realize how long he had already been without her, when once he had so disliked her briefest absence. I had wanted her mother to feel it was worthwhile to have her enter my service, he said, as the late Grand Counselor at his death had urged her to do. What a shame, he felt very sorry. At any rate, I should be able to do something for my son, as long as he grows up properly she must take care that she lives to see it. Miobu showed him the gifts she had received. If only this were the hairpin that she sent back from beyond, he thought. But alas, it was not. He murmured, he murmured, Oh, that I might find a wizard to seek her out. That I might know, I might, that I might then know, at least from distant report, where her distant spirit has gone. A superb artist had done the painting of Yoki, Yokihi, but the brush can convey only so much, and her picture lacked the breath of life. The face so like the lotuses in the Taeki River, or Lake, Taeki Lake, or the willows by the Mio Palace, was no doubt strikingly beautiful in its Chinese way, but when he remembered how sweet and dear his love had been, he found himself unable to compare her to flowers or birdsong. Morning and evening, he had assured her that they would share a wing in flight as birds or their branches as trees. But then she had died, and the resulting vanity of his promises 
filled him with unending sorrow. The sound of the wind and the calling of crickets only deepened his melancholy, and meanwhile he heard the Kokidan consort, who had not come for so long now to wait on him. After dark, making the best of a beautiful moon by, the playing music far into the night, he did not like it, and he wished it would stop. Those gentlewomen and privy gentlemen who knew his mood found that it grated upon their ears. The offender, willful and abrasive, seemed determined to behave as though nothing had happened. The moon set. When above the clouds tear in a veil of darkness, hide the autumn moon, how could there be light below a among the humble grasses, his majesty murmured, his thoughts going to the lady whom Miobu had recently left, and he stayed up until the lamp wicks had burnt out. It must have been the hour of the ox, because he heard the right gate watch reporting for duty. He then returned to his curtained bed, for he did not wish to make himself conspicuous. But still, he could not sleep. He remembered when morning came, and it was time to rise, how once he had not even known that daybreak was upon him. And again, he seemed likely to miss his morning session in council. He only went through the motions of breaking his fast, and took no greater interest in his midday meal, until all who served him grieved to see his state, those in close attendance upon him, and gentlemen alike, murmured anxiously about how disturbing it all was. Perhaps he had been fated to love her, but for him to have ignored the reproofs and the anger of so many, to have flouted for her sake the standards of proper conduct, and even now to ignore public affairs as he was doing, this, they all whispered, was most unfortunate. And they cited in this connection events in the land beyond the sea, In time, the little boy went to join his father in the palace. He was turning out to be so handsome that he hardly seemed of this world at all, and for his majesty this aroused a certain dread. The next spring, when his majesty was to designate the heir apparent, he longed to pass over his elder son in favor of his younger, but since the younger lacked support, and since in any case the world at large would never accept such a choice. He desisted for the boy's sake and kept his desire to himself. He could hardly go that far, people assured one another, no matter how devoted to him he may be. The Kokiden consort was relieved. As for the grandmother, she remained inconsolable and wished only to join her daughter, which no doubt is why she too, to his majesty's boundless sorrow, at last passed away. The boy was then entering his sixth year. This time he understood what had happened, and he cried. Towards the end, she who had been close to him for so long spoke again and again of how sad she was to leave him. Now the boy was permanently in attendance at the palace. When he reached his seventh year, his majesty had him perform his first reading, which he carried off with such unheard of brilliance that his father was frankly alarmed. Surely none of you can dislike him now, he said. After all, he no longer has a mother. Please be nice to him. When he took him to the Kokiden, the consort there led him straight through her blinds and would not release him, for the sight of him would have brought smiles to the fiercest warrior, even an enemy one. She had given his majesty two daughters, but by, by no stretch of the imagination, could either be compared with him. Nor did any other imperial lady hide from him, because he was already so charmingly distinguished in manner that they found him a delightful and challenging playmate. Naturally, he applied himself to formal scholarship, but he also set the heavens ringing with the music of strings and flute. In fact, if I were to list all the things at which he excelled, I would only succeed in making him sound absurd. During this time, Tenosama learnt that a delegation from Koma included an expert 
physiognomist, and since it would have contravened Emperor Uda's solemn admonition to call him to the palace, he instead sent his son secretly to the Korodkan. The right grand controller, charged with taking him there, presented him as his own. The astonished physiognomist nodded his head again and again in perplexity. He has the signs of one destined to become the father of his people and to achieve the sovereign's supreme eminence, he said. And yet when I see him so, I fear disorder and suffering. But when I see him as the future pillar of the court and the support of all the realm, there again appears to be a mismatch. The controller himself was a man of deep learning, and his conversation with the visitor was most interesting. They exchanged poems, and when the physiognomist, who was soon to leave, made a very fine one, expressing joy at having met so extraordinary a boy, together with sorrow upon parting from him, the boy composed some moving lines of his own, which the visitor admired extravagantly before presenting him with handsome gifts. The visitor, too, received many gifts conveying to him from his majesty. Conveyed to him from his majesty. Sorry about that. News of this encounter got about, as such news will, and although his majesty never mentioned it, the minister of the right, the heir apparent's grandfather, wondered suspiciously what it might mean. His majesty was greatly impressed to find that the visitor's reading tallied with one that he had obtained in his wisdom through the art of physiognomy as practiced in Japan, and on the strength of which he had refrained from naming his son a prince. He therefore decided that, rather than set the boy adrift as an unranked prince, unsupported by any maternal relative, he would assure him a more promising future, since after all, his own reign might be brief. By having him serve the realm as a commoner, in this spirit, he had him apply himself more di diligently than ever to his studies. It was a shame to make a subject of him, considering his gifts, but he was a bound to draw suspicion as a prince, and when consultation with an eminent astrologer only confirmed this prediction, his majesty resolved to make him a Genji. Month after month, year after year, his majesty never forgot his lost haven. After summoning several likely prospects, he sorrowfully concluded that he would never find her like again in this world. But then he heard from a dam of staff about another possibility, the fourth child of a fourth emperor, of a former emperor, a girl known for her beauty and brought up by her mother, the empress, with the greatest care. Owing that emperor her office as she did, the dam had served the young lady's mother intimately as well, and so she had known her too from infancy. In fact, she saw her from time to time, even now. In all my three reigns of service at court, I have seen no one like your majesty's late haven, she said. But the princess I referred to has grown to be very like her. She's a pleasure to look at. His majesty approached the mother with great circumspection, eager to discover the truth of this report. She received his proposal with alarm, because she knew how unpleasant the heir apparent's mother could be and she shrank from exposing her daughter to the blatant contempt with which this consort had treated her Kiritsubo rival. So it was that she passed away before she could bring herself to consent. Once the daughter was alone, his majesty pressed his suit earnestly, assuring her that she would be to him as a daughter of his own, her gentlewoman, those properly concerned with her interests, and her elder brother, his highness of war, all agreed that she would be far better off at the palace than forlorn at home, and they therefore insisted that she should go. She was called Fuchitsubo. She resembled that other lady to a truly astonishing degree, but since she was of far higher standing, commanded willing respect and could not possibly be treated lightly. She had no need to defer to anyone on any matter. His majesty had clung all too fondly to his old love, despite universal disapproval. And he did not forget her now, but in a touching way, his affection turned to this new arrival, who was a great consolation to him. 
None of his majesty's ladies could remain shy with the young Genji, especially the one he now saw so often, because he hardly ever left his father's side. All of them took pride in their looks, no doubt with good reason, but they were no longer in the first blush of youth. Whereas the new princess was both young and charming, and Genji naturally caught glimpses of her, although she did what she could to keep out of his sight. He had no memory of his mother, but his youthful interest was aroused when the Dama of Staff told him how much the princess resembled her, and he wanted always to be with her so as to contemplate her to his heart's content. His majesty, who cared so deeply for both of them, asked her not to maintain her reserve. I am not sure why, he said, but it seems right to me that he should take you for his mother. Do not think him uncivil. Just be kind to him. His face and eyes are so like hers that your own resemblance to her makes it look quite natural. Genji therefore lost no chance offered by the least flower or autumn leave to let her know in his childish way how much he liked her. Tenodono's fondness for her prompted the Kokiden consort to fall out with her, as she had done with Genji's mother, until her old animosity returned, and she took an, adver an aversion to Genji as well. Okay, that's kind of sad. Genji's looks had an indescribably fresh sweetness, one beyond even her highness's celebrated into his majesty peerless beauty, and this moved people to call him the Shining Lord, or Hikaru, which means shining light. Since Fujitsubo made a pair with him, and his majesty loved them both, they called her the Sunlight Princess. His majesty was reluctant to spoil Genji's boyish charm, but in Genji's twelfth year, he gave him his coming of age, busying himself personally with the preparations and adding new embellishments uh, to the ceremony, lest the event seem less imposing, imposing than the one for the heir apparent, done some years ago in the Shishin Den. And lest anything go amiss, he issued minute instructions for the banquets to be offered by the various government offices and for the things normally provided by the court repository and imperial granary, eliciting from them perfection in all they supplied. He had his throne face east from the outer eastern chamber of his residence, with the seats for the young man and his sponsor, the minister before him. Genji appeared at the hour of the monkey. Tenodono appeared to regret that Genji would never look again as he did now, with his hair tied in twin tresses and his face radiant with the freshness of youth. The Lord of the Treasury and the Chamberlain did their duty. The Lord of the Treasury was plainly sorry to cut off such beautiful hair, and His Majesty, who wished desperately that his haven might have been there to see it, needed the greatest self-mastery not to weep. All present shed tears when, after donning the headdress and withdrawing to the anteroom, Genji then reappeared in the robes of a man, and stepped down into the garden to salute his sovereign. His majesty, of course, was still more deeply moved, and in his mind he sadly reviewed the past when the boy's mother had been such a comfort to him. He had feared that Genji's looks might suffer once his hair was put up, at least while he remained so young, but not at all. He only looked more devastatingly handsome than ever. By her highness, his wife, the sponsoring minister, had a beloved only daughter in whom the heir apparent had expressed interest, but whom, after long hesitation, he felt more inclined to offer to Genji instead. When he had sounded out the emperor's own feelings on the matter, his majesty replied, Very well, she may be just the companion for him. Now that he seems, now that he seems no longer to have anyone looking after him, and this had encouraged His Excellency to proceed. Genji Rift drew to the anteroom, and then took the very last seat among the princes. While the assembled company enjoyed their wine, His Excellency dropped hints to him about the, this marriage, but Genji was at a bashful age, and gave him no real response. Then a lady from the office of staff sent His Excellency a message from His Majesty, requiring his presence, 
and His Excellency obeyed forthwith. One of His Majesty's gentlewomen took the gifts from his own hands to bestow them on His Excellency. They included, according to custom, a white oversized woman's gown and a set of women's robes. On handing him the wine cup, His Majesty gave pointed expression to his feelings. Into that first knot to bind up his boyish hair did you tie the wish that enduring happiness be theirs for ages to come. In that very mood I tied his hair with great prayer, bound henceforth at last just as long as the dark hue of the purple does not fade. His Excellency replied before stepping down from the long bridge to perform his obeisance. There, he received a horse from the left imperial stables and a perched falcon from the chamberlain's office. The prince and senior nobles then lined up before, below the steps, each to receive his gift. The delicacies in Simpress boxes and the fruit baskets had been prepared for the emperor that day by the right grand controller, at his majesty's own command. There were so many rice dumplings and so many chests of gold, of cloth, I mean, certainly more than when the heir apparent came of age, that there was hardly any room for them all. It was in fact Genji's ceremony that displayed truly magnificent liberality. That evening, His Majesty sent Genji to the minister's residence, where His Excellency welcomed him and gave the ensuing rite a dazzling brilliance. The family found Genji preternaturally attractive, despite his still being such a child. But His Excellency's daughter, somewhat older, thought him much too young, and was ashamed that he should suit her so poorly. His Excellency enjoyed His Majesty's highest regard, and the princess who had borne him his daughter was moreover His Majesty's full sister. Both were therefore of supreme distinction, and the Minister of the Right cut a poor figure now that Genji had joined them, too, despite being destined one day to rule the realm as the grandfather of the heir apparent. His Excellency had many children by various ladies. By Her Highness, he had apart from his daughter a very young and promising Chamberlain lieutenant, whom the Minister of the Right had wished to secure as a son-in-law, even though he was hardly on good terms with the young man's father, and whom he had therefore matched with his beloved fourth daughter. He treated the young man just as well as Genji's father-in-law treated Genji, and the two son-in-laws got on perfectly together. Genji was not free to live at home, for his majesty summoned him too often. In his heart, he saw only Fujitsubo's peerless beauty. Ah, he thought, she is the kind of woman I want to marry. There is no one like her. His Excellency's daughter was no doubt very pretty and well brought up, but he felt little for her, because he had lost his boyish heart to someone else. Indeed, he had done so to the point of pain. Now that Genji was an adult, his majesty no longer allowed him through Fujitsubo's curtains, to be with her as before. Whenever there was music, he would accompany her koto on his flute. This and the faint sound of her voice through the blinds were his consolations. And he wanted never to live anywhere but in the palace. Only after waiting upon his majesty for five or six days might he now, and again put in two or three at his excellencies. But he was so young that the minister did not really mind and he treated his son-in-law generously. His Excellency selected the least ordinary among the available gentlewomen for Genji's service. These entered with him into his favorite pastimes and looked after him very well. His, res his residence at the palace was the Kili Kilitsubo, as before, and His Majesty kept his mother's gentlewoman together so as to have them serve him in turn. He also decreed that the office of upkeep and the office of artisans should rebuild his mother's home, which they did beautifully. The layout of the trees and garden hills was already very pleasant, but with much bustle and noise, they handsomely enlarged the lake. Genji kept wishing with many sighs that he had a true love to come and live with him there. They say that his nickname, the Shining Lord, was given him in praise by the man from Koma. And that's the prologue to Genji Monogatari by the remarkable Shikibu Murasaki. So if you enjoyed this video and wish to leave your own indelible mark as 
the Princess Fujitsubo certainly did on Genji, feel free to like and subscribe.